All right. Well, we've heard a lot of Christmas songs, haven't we, these past days? And uh, as we stare 2021 in the face, uh, starting this coming Friday, I'm grateful that a new year is beginning, aren't you? I'm hoping that uh, 2021 will <clears throat> dim some of the things that we have seen happen in 2020. Tonight, once again, we look at the book of Colossians. We've been doing a study of uh, Paul's prison letters. The Apostle Paul was one of the greatest missionaries that ever lived from the time of Lottie Moon there in China, who started uh, working among the Chinese people and sharing Christ. Uh, we as Southern Baptists have always uh, given toward the Lottie Moon Christmas offering because those offerings go all over the world. They don't just go to one locale. And so through the, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, and I want to push that, we will continue to take Lottie Moon Christmas offering through the month of January. But people all over the world get to hear the gospel because of this uh, great missionary endeavor, this great mission program that we have through the Southern Baptist uh, Convention. And it's because of Lottie Moon many years ago that we always recognize the Lottie Moon Christmas offering and what it does. As I think about the Apostle Paul being one of the greatest missionaries of all time, we've been looking at the book of Ephesians. We looked at the book of Philippians, and now we are making our trek through the book of Colossians, and then after Colossians, we'll look at the book of Philemon, or Philemon, however you want to pronounce that. Uh, these four are prison epistles or prison letters that the apostle Paul wrote to these various churches. They're at Galatia and Colossae and um, uh, to uh, the uh, Ephesians and uh, then to Philemon. And uh, Paul was writing from a Roman prison. In Paul's day, Paul was having to write uh, during a time as the church was birthed, as the church was expanding, as the church was moving gloriously across that stage of human history, there were things that were becoming a threat to the church. Now, you and I live in a world today where there are all kinds of threats to uh, religion, to our uh, Christianity, and we've seen lots of that this past year, but some of the things that threatened that early church that Paul would write about to various churches, uh, there were different uh, philosophies that were out there that were creeping into the church, creating problems, creating dissensions, creating schisms and divisions. Some of those things that Paul had to deal with and had to address would be Eastern mysticisms, astrology, uh, philosophy, Jewish legalism, as well as some of the other things known as Stoicism, Epicureanism, and Gnosticism. These were all various philosophies, ideologies that were making their way and threatening uh, the church. And so tonight, whenever we look at verses 11 in Colossians chapter 2 and following, what Paul is going to deal with is uh, Judaistic legalism. Many of these people had turned from uh, their Judaism now to faith in Christ. And it was uh, kind of hard for some of them to leave those legalistic uh, ways of Judaism and the Old Testament uh, uh, laws, which could not take away their sins. And so Paul continues to deal with these things that were problems. And so in verse 11... Paul says, in him, he's speaking about Christ. In him, he's saying here to these Colossian Christians, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. You will remember to become a Jew, one of the physical um, 
uh, things that Jewish men had to do was go through the rite of circumcision in the Old Testament under that old dispensation. It was a physical mark of God's covenant people, but it also had a spiritual aspect to it. Now that Paul is writing to Gentiles, as well as there were Jewish people here, but Paul was saying that under this new covenant, no longer under that old uh, legalistic uh, system of the Old Testament that man could not meet the demands of a holy God. It was just a mere shadow or a mere picture or a mere photograph of things that were to come. And so in verse 11, he speaks about circumcision that, that in order to become a Christian, the Gentiles did not have to have this physical circumcision of the flesh as they did in that old covenant. But now it would be a spiritual circumcision of the heart. And that that would be from the new birth in Christ. Notice he says, with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. Paul is wanting these Christians to know that once you have identified with Christ Jesus, then you have taken on Christ. And there ought to be a new heart. And since Christ is the great cardio, the word cardio means heart. Gnosis means to know. There in the Greek, he's the great cardio gnosis. He's the great heart knower. And if there's been a, a circumcision of the heart, meaning that we are now in Christ Jesus, it's not a circumcision of the flesh, but it is to have the heart for Christ and to be in Christ he speaks about how we ought to live our lives, that we ought to strive. As long as you and I are in a fleshly body, our body is going to be bent toward temptations. Oftentimes, sometimes, we fail in our endeavor to allow the Spirit of God to move within us and to lead us. And sometimes we fall into that old uh, lifestyle of letting our flesh control us. And so he's reminding these Christians that they are now in Christ Jesus and that they need to live lives that would be worthy of being in Christ Jesus. He says in verse 12, buried with him in baptism. And what he means is that you and I, when we go under the water in the baptismal waters up there through immer immersion, it symbolizes uh, the death of an old way of life. It, uh, we are buried in baptism with Christ. You and I could go through the baptismal waters a hundred times, but water will not save you. Water will not save any of us. We are saved by grace through faith. It's unmerited favor. We are saved because of the blood of Christ, which cleanses us from all unrighteous, which cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And so he uses this picture of baptism. It's an outward picture that we've had this inward circumcision of the heart, this inward change. We are buried with Christ, he says, in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. In other words, when Christ died on the cross, he nailed our sins to the cross. I don't know about you, but doesn't that give you great pause tonight? Doesn't that give you great hope tonight to realize that Christ Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe sin, had left its crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Water couldn't wash it away. There's not good works couldn't wash it away. Uh, money can't wash it away. Only the blood of Christ, when he nailed our sins to the cross, could wash away and take away our sins. And so he speaks about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. He says in verse 13, And you, being dead in your trespasses 
and the uncircumcision of your flesh. He, Christ, has made alive together with him. God has made alive together with him. Heaven forgiven you all trespasses. Isn't it great that God, through Christ, has forgiven us of our trespasses and our sins? He has made alive together with him. Heaven forgiven you all trespasses. I think so many of us fail to understand that when Christ paid the sin debt, he paid for our past sins. He's paid for our present sins. What does sin mean? It means to miss the mark. It would be like an archer out there shooting an arrow toward a goal, toward a mark out there and missing the mark. That's what sin is. We miss the mark. And this morning I alluded to the fact that we may be saved, but you and I are not safe until we get to heaven one of these days. Yes, saved, but we're not safe from the attack of the devil, from the attack of the enemy. And Satan comes, and he comes to destroy, and he comes to deceive, and he comes to try to lead us astray. But I love where Paul Pins these words here in verse 13. Heaven forgiven you all trespasses. Let me tell you, if tomorrow comes and you and I find ourselves in the world, whatever sin we would commit, they've been forgiven. Now, that does not give us a license to go out in sin. And I think oftentimes that people fail to understand that we as Southern Baptists, we believe that the Bible teaches that once we are saved, if we truly, genuinely got saved, then we are saved forevermore. And the Bible says there's nobody that can pluck us out of the Father's hand. And, uh, but I think oftentimes people fail to understand the difference in the Holy Spirit that lives within our heart. God in Christ through the Holy Spirit lives in our heart and life. So we are spirit, but we're also flesh. The Bible says those two things war against each other. And whichever one you and I feed the most, that's what wins out. I can't, let me say this, if, if you've ever been truly saved, and you just continue to live in sin day after day after day after day. And you never feel convicted. You never were saved. You never got saved. You just had an experience. But it wasn't a genuine experience. You see, when we are in Christ, the Holy Spirit lives within us. And if we do not feel conviction when we do err, when we do sin then there's something the matter with us, spiritually speaking. I don't know about you, but when I do something that I know is not right or say something that uh, immediately, immediately, the Holy Spirit brings conviction on my life. And the first thing I want to do is ask God to forgive me. Now, I know, in essence, because of what Scripture says, he's already forgiven me. This says, having forgiven you all trespasses. That word all, the last time I looked it up in Webster, still means all. It's inclusive. My past sins were forgiven at Calvary. My present sins are forgiven today because of Calvary. And my future sins tomorrow will be forgiven because of Calvary, because he has forgiven them all. Now, let me explain that. You say, well, I don't think I sin. Well, let me ask you a question. The Bible says to him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it's sin. Was there someone today you could have given your testimony to? Was there someone you met out on the street that you could have told about Jesus and you didn't? To him that knows to do good. 
What if there was somebody out there that needed something in their life? Maybe they needed food. Maybe they needed some help in some way. And you just walk by like many did on that road that day when the one was lying in the ditch. Finally, a good Samaritan came by and tried to help them out of their situation. You see, every day of our lives, there's something we could have done that we failed to do. The Bible says to him that knows to do good and does it not to him, it's sin. So we do sin. But I'm thankful that when I have done something wrong, immediately I'm drawn into the presence of the Holy Spirit that knocks on my heart's door and reminds me. And you know the very first thing that I want to do, even though I know I've been forgiven, I want to have fellowship with the Father. And if I have sinned, I'm still his child. He's still my father. I'm still saved. But I have broken my fellowship with him. And I can't get that restored until I say, Lord, forgive me of that that I just did. I think that's why so many Christians professing Christians, and I hope they're possessing Christians. It's one thing to profess something. It's another thing to possess it. But you see, I think that's where a lot of us live under the radar of living the abundant life that Jesus talked about in John 10, 10, when he said, I've come to give you life and to give you life more abundantly. The reason that many of us are not living the abundant life in Christ is because we have unconfessed sin in our hearts and lives. And therefore, we have broken our fellowship, not our relationship. There's a huge difference in relationship. You and your child may have some disagreement about something in life. And you've parted ways and they are estranged to you and you are estranged to them. You didn't break your relationship. You're still their parent. They're still your offspring, your, your child. But you may have broken that fellowship. And until you get it together with them, that fellowship is broken. And I think many, 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 many people that profess Christ, I think they have broken fellowship with him. Do you remember when David sinned with Bathsheba over there in the Old Testament? David took another man's wife and he committed adultery and, and uh, she became pregnant and David had Uriah, her husband, sent out there into the heat of battle, knowing that he would be killed because David was trying to cover up that sin. If you will remember, it was a year. It was nearly a year before David ever confessed to God his sin. Now, the Bible tells us in the psalm that David, that his bones waxed within him. He was in pain for a year, physical pain, emotional stress. And David wasn't going to take that to God. Let me tell you, God always brings somebody your way to remind you. God brought a man by the name of Nathan. Nathan told David a little story. And it infuriated David. Because David wanted to quickly jump on and condemn the one in the story that Nathan was sharing with him. And when David responded and reacted to that story, Nathan pointed his finger at David and said, you're the man. <laughs> you're the one I'm talking about. The Bible said that David, in that 51st Psalm, and you can go back and read it, where David repented of that sin to restore his fellowship with the Father. Oftentimes, our fellowship is broken, not our relationship. I'm thankful that my sins, both past, present, and future, are covered under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
It's just that when I sin, I'm convicted by the Holy Spirit who is the compass, who leads me into all truth. And when I have missed the mark, the Holy Spirit brings conviction upon my life. If the Holy Spirit does not convict you, you better check out your salvation experience to see if you really genuinely have a salvation experience. Let me tell you, that's one of the truest signs that I know that you can determine whether or not you're saved. If when you've done wrong, you immediately know it because the Holy Spirit leads you into all truth and the Holy Spirit brings conviction. I'm grateful that Paul is speaking to them here under a new covenant, a new nature. Not the old nature of the flesh, but this new nature. In verse 14, he goes on and he speaks about uh, this forgiveness for all trespasses. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. Let me tell you, that old testament system no matter how many animals were sacrificed no matter no matter how many times the priest would offer up the blood of the animals let me tell you that could not take away their sin it was just a shadow of things to come having wiped out the handwriting of requirements remember that old levitical system that was against us, he says, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Oh, I'll tell you what. Even though you and I are living in a postmodern world, we are living in what some call a post-Christian era. We are living in a time where people don't want to believe the Bible. But I want you to know, I believe that he nailed it to the cross and he said, Tetelestai, the Greek term for it is finished. Finished. You see, if you could be saved and lost and saved and lost and saved and lost, every time you were lost, you'd have to call Christ back to come back to the cross and folks he's not going to do it he did it once for all he nailed our sins he's forgiven them and I like what Bertha Smith the great missionary also to China Bertha Smith said one day the Lord has removed my sins as far as the east is from the west and he posted a sign that says no fishing in other words He's removed our transgressions and our iniquities, and he nailed them to the cross. Verse 15, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So, let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon of Sabbath. Those were those Jewish things they did, which are a shadow. There it is. It'd be like a photograph of things to come. But the substance is of Christ. Let no one cheat you of your reward taking delight in false humility and worship of angels. He's telling them we're not to worship angels. Those are those created beings that God uses according to the book of Hebrews. They are ministering spirits who come to our aid, the Bible says, to help us uh, for those who will inherit salvation. They may be visible in the form of some human that God sends an angel along to help us. Or they may be invisible. There are angels all around us. But he speaks about this. We are to worship Jesus Christ. We aren't to worship Mary. We're not to worship uh, angels. 
He says, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. So, verse 18, he said, says, let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels. Obviously, there are those out there. Many people worship angels. Lots of people put too much emphasis on Mary. We, as Southern Baptists, we, we don't deify or glorify Mary in any way. She was just the vehicle through which the Holy Spirit conceived and brought Jesus into the world. Yes, she was highly favored among women because she was the one that God himself chose. But we're not to venerate these angels or Mary or anyone else but Christ alone. Verse 19, and not holding fast to the head from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with the increase that is from God. Remember, Christ is the head. The church belongs to the Lord. Therefore, Paul says in verse 20, therefore, that when you see the word therefore, look to see what it's there for. He's saying, in other words, everything that he's already taught us in this chapter. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, and that means when we die with Christ, we are in Christ. We have died in Christ. We are buried with Christ in baptism. We are raised in Christ to newness of life. We're a new creation in Christ. He says, why as those living in the world do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. And so Paul breaks out and he talks about these false religions, these false ritualistic systems that absolutely have no value whatsoever to them. But it's Christ and in Christ alone that you and I are made whole. We are made complete. We are justified in Christ. Justified as if we had never sinned. I'm grateful and I'm thankful for the eternal security of my salvation. Aren't you thankful tonight? For the eternal security of your salvation. There's absolutely nothing that can keep us from the love of Christ. And I'm thankful tonight for the word of God. The truth of scripture which mirrors to you and me. And through the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. Would you stand as we pray together tonight. Father thank you for this time that we've had to come together. God I pray that you would bless us from week to week as Ken comes to lead us in this invitation song. I pray, Lord, if there's someone here that needs to trust you or someone looking for a church home, that they might respond to the Holy Spirit's leading. In Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen.